So now we want to talk about the magnetic force on two wires. So imagine if we have two wires flowing the same direction, I and I prime. This guy, that's moving charges. That's what current is. Moving charges create magnetic fields. So this guy is creating a magnetic field that goes in circles around him. This guy also has moving charges in him. Moving charges are affected by magnetic fields. So this guy's magnetic field is going to create a magnetic force on the charges moving in this guy. And that's either going to attract or repel that other wire. So let's talk about this conceptually. Here, they, here's the answer. Here's the magnitude of the force per unit length of wire. So if you have a homework question that asks you to calculate the magnitude of the force between court, um, current carrying wires, that's the formula you'll use. I just want to talk about it conceptually and get our directions right. Okay, so let's say we have, I'm going to call them I1 and I2 flowing in the same direction. Okay, so let's look at I1. Anytime something's going straight, put your thumb in the direction of the straight guy and your fingers will curl around in the direction of the curly guy. So I is straight, B will be curly. If B were straight, I would be curly. So I curls around, or B curls around this wire. If we were looking at it from above, if here were the current flowing out toward our eyeball, thumb in the direction of the straight one, B would go around in circles. So we get magnetic field lines that never start or stop, and they would drop off like one over distance. If I went twice the distance, I would get one half the magnetic field. Okay, so this guy's magnetic field is going into the board over in this half, goes behind the wire and out of the board over here. So let's draw a bunch of magnetic field vectors caused by I1. That was into the board over here. And that's everywhere over here. But what I really care about is what's happening on this other wire. And then out of the board over here. So this guy here has a magnetic field that points down. Now remember, the force is, I don't remember if I need, I never remember this formula. The force goes like I cross B. I don't remember if I need a mu naught here. I think there is, but that's not the, we're only looking at direction right now. I don't care about the magnitude. The magnetic force will be proportional to and point in the direction of I cross B. So I points that way. I have to spin my hand around until my middle finger points in the direction of B. That's down. Then my thumb is F. So my magnetic force on this wire will point that direction to the, the left. Okay, we can play a similar game with the other guy. This guy's creating magnetic field lines. Thumb in the direction of the straight guy. Fingers curl around in the direction of B. So over here, his magnetic force lines are into the board. And over here, out of the board. So in particular, on this other wire, his magnetic field lines, the red here, are field lines from I2 coming out of the board there, then F will be I cross B. I have to spin my hand around, pointer finger in the direction of I. I need my middle finger to point toward B. That's the wrong way. B is up. So I have to spin my hand around I, B, F. Some people play this game with FBI, but I literally, I can never, I think it goes, FBI, like I don't think like that. FBI, I just think I cross B equals F. 
so the force points toward the center. So these two wires are attracted to each other. And you can see this. If you're running two wires with direct current and the current's flowing the same direction, you can watch it. It's a cool little experiment. As soon as you turn on the currents, the wires will go and get attracted to each other. And you turn it off and they'll go back. Hey, what if we're going in opposite directions? Let's quickly go through that. So what if this guy I1 is going up, but I2 is flowing down? So again, his magnetic field lines over here on this side point into the board. Okay, now I gotta arrange my hand. The force will go like I cross B. Technically, I is not a vector, it's I dl cross b the direction of current so i want to point my pointer finger in the direction of i get my thumb pointed in the or my middle finger pointed in the direction of b It's hard to do. Okay. Pointer finger, middle finger down in the direction of B. My thumb is pointing that way. Similarly, if you play the same game over here on this guy, you try this on your own, you'll see you get a force that points outward. So these two guys will repel each other. So you got two wires, you turn on your current, and you can watch the wires just go whoop. So what's that mean? If the two wires are going in the same direction, they attract, opposites repel. It's, the, it's counterintuitive. It's the opposite of what you would expect. Same attracts, opposites repel. Like your intuition would tell you it'd probably be the other way, but it's not. So from now on, you just memorize that. Same attract, opposite repel. And again, if you have a homework question that asks for the magnitude of that force, it's right here. Oh, and there is not a mu naught. There is. It's I times the vector that points in the direction of I cross B. So there's not a mu naught in the magnitude of the force. Okay, I want to talk about a coil. Now imagine we have a whole bunch of loops of wire. We had already talked about one loop of wire. I think we've talked about one loop. No, okay, here's one loop. So we've got a current flowing in a loop. My current is flowing around like this. I want to calculate the magnetic field from this loop of current. So we'd use the B.O. Sabar law to calculate the magnetic field right along the axis of that circle. Uh, this is another calculated computation. I'm not going to go through it here. Your book goes through the whole thing. It's this nasty integral. Notice again, just this happens a lot. We get something raised to the three has power in the denominator. We end up with this. That's not, I mean, if you have a, a homework question that asks you to find the magnitude of the magnetic field from a loop of wire, there's your formula you use. What I want to talk about is the right-hand rule. Which direction is that kind of point? And the easiest way to do this is if something's curly, use your fingers. If something's straight, use B. Use your thumb. 
So I've got some wire where current is flowing around, say, counterclockwise. Anytime something's curly, the other guy's going to be straight. So I flows around like this. That will create a magnetic field right in the center that points straight up. So B will be up. Curly guy for the curly guy, straight guy for the straight guy. What if I is flowing around like this? See, I have to flip my hand around to curl my fingers around like that. So the one that's curly, I'm using my fingers for. The one that goes in a straight line, I'm using my thumb for. B. would go into the board. Hey, what if we had a whole bunch of wires, a coil of wires? So I've got some wire coming along and then it's doing this. And I'm exaggerating the distance between these. These would be all tightly wound up. So I'm going to try to draw this in a way that my drawing skills are not the best. So these parts I'm kind of knocking out are behind the board. So this wire is flowing like this. It's coming out at you, going back into the board, out at you, back into the board. That will create a magnetic field n times bigger than this. If I have n coils, then I'll get n times the magnetic field inside that coil. It, we call this a solenoid. And it will be in the direction of fingers will curl around the direction that I is flowing. So B will point in that direction. So inside here, in this region inside the solenoid, B is nearly constant and points in that direction. This is how your car starts. This is the. Uh, starter on your car has a solenoid. It has one of these and there's a piece of metal in here that connects to another end of the circuit over here and your, like I may have some of these details wrong, but this is the general idea. Your starter, you send a current to the solenoid that induces a magnetic field in here that pulls this magnet over to create a, a connection to complete this circuit and your car starts. All right, you guys all know that MRI machines use magnets. You can read about that if you want. Okay, Ampere's law. Remember, Gauss's law for magnetism says that there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. Gauss's law for magnets says the double integral of B dot dA through any closed surface is zero. So that's it. If you have some 2D surface in space, and you want to measure all the magnetic flux that flows through that surface, it will always be zero because magnetic field lines never start or end because there's no such thing as a magnetic charge. So even if I have a magnet over here, whether it's inside or outside, any field lines that flow through my surface will flow in and then flow back out. That's Gauss's law. But I don't like to think of it like, like that. I'd like to think of Ampere's law as kind of like the analogy for Gauss's law for charges. Ampere's law says if you take any closed loop, 
So it's one dimension smaller than Gauss's law. It actually comes from Green's theorem or in higher dimension, Stokes' theorem. Gauss's law comes from the divergence theorem. This comes from Stokes' theorem. And this says you take any closed loop, so not an entire surface, just any loop with a direction. So say I'm traversing this loop. So this is a one dimensional object and it could be in space, it could be like this, but I'm not covering that surface. I'm just talking about this line here. And you measure all the currents that flow through the area that that thing carves out. So I measure all my currents, say I've got some, maybe some I flowing out here, another one flowing in here, maybe I won. I2, maybe some other current is flowing like this. If you measure all the currents that pass through this surface, then the line integral around that surface of B dot DL will be mu naught, the permittivity of free or permeability of free space times the current the total current that passes through that cross-sectional area. So currents create magnetic field lines, right? Like this guy right here, he's going up like that. He's going to create magnetic field lines that go in circles around him. So he'll have a little magnetic field line right there. What I want to measure is the amount of field that flows parallel to my line here. So right here at this spot, say for example, I've got this magnetic field that's going in circles around that current. Right there at that spot on my loop, I'll get a little magnetic field vector right there, a little B. That B is running parallel to my line, or at least some component of it is running parallel to my line. So I'm going to take the dot product of B and a little differential length there, figure out the component of B that runs parallel to my line here. I'm going to do that all the way around my surface. So every point on the, the surface, maybe right here, all my Bs from all my currents, maybe they add up to right at that spot, the magnetic field looks like that. I want to know how much of that B runs parallel to my line right here. So I dot that with DL, which is a little differential that's parallel to my, or tangent to my line. The dot product tells me the component of B that's parallel to DL. And we add that up all the way around. That's this side. So that's not a flux at all. I'm not measuring B passing through my surface. I'm measuring B along the line. This is a line integral. Line integrals are hard. They're much harder than surface integrals. You have to parameterize B. You have to parameterize DL. Yeah, line integrals are a pain. They're probably the worst integral you do in all of Calc 3. Ampere's law says you don't have to do the line integral. Figure out how much current flows through the area you've carved out, multiply by mu naught, and you know this total contribution of B along that line. So say we had Just a single line of current. Okay, so I'm going to quickly do this problem. I have an entire video about this. This is the first video on Ampere's Law, but I'm just going to quickly do it again. I have current flowing up. I want to figure out the magnetic field some distance R away. I want to figure out the magnetic field right there. I did the same problem using the Bios of R Law the other day. And it took me like 15 minutes to do the problem. It was a really, really nasty problem, a nasty integral and everything. 
This is going to take like a minute and a half. I create an Empyrean loop that exploits the symmetry here. So I have circular symmetry here. I want a loop that's a circle. So that here's my line. That circle is going around the line. From the top view, if here's my current flowing straight out, Here's my loop, a distance r away from that current. Okay, so we know using the right hand rule, the magnetic field will go around the line like this. So in this picture, right hand rule, B flows around like this. So I want to traverse my line in the same direction. I want B and DL to be parallel. So I'm going to go around my loop like this. I have to choose a direction to do a line integral. And I'm choosing to go around counterclockwise. B points here, DL. The direction I'm pointing, little tangential vectors point parallel to B. So B dot dl parallel vectors would just be magnitude of b dl. The dot product of parallel vectors is the product of the magnitudes. So the line integral around that closed loop of b dot dl would just be magnitude of b, the integral of dl. Well, what is that? What's the antiderivative of dl? L. What does L mean? L means length. That's just the length of the curve. That's the length of my Empyrean loop. How long is that loop? It's a circle. 2 pi r. And that's supposed to equal mu naught times the current enclosed. Well, how much current? flows through the area I've carved out, all of it, I. So magnitude of B is mu naught I over two pi R. We're done. There's the magnetic field caused by a line of current. Hey, what if we have a coax cable. So a coax cable has one current flowing up, and then that current comes back in this sheath around here flowing back down. So whatever current flows up flows back down. If I create an Empyrean loop around this, The double inter or the single integral, the line of B dot DL should be mu naught times the total current enclosed. Well, my total current enclosed is zero. All my current that flows up also flows back down. So the currents cancel out. Over here, we get zero. This side is the same thing. If I'm a distance R, this is exactly the same thing we got before. B times 2 pi r, none of that matters. B is 0. So the magnetic field from a coax cable is 0 out here, out some distance away from the cable. That's why we use coax cables.